Okay, back in Exodus. <clears throat> Our focus today is going to be in uh, chapter 14. You know, we left off last week with the 10th plague. What happened in the 10th plague? Exodus, Exodus 14. Firstborn. Firstborn male of every household, of every human and animal, <laughs> were killed by the death angel as God passed over, right? Okay? So, and then Pharaoh said, all right, not only can you go, please go. You must go. <laughs> Get out of here. And the Lord had told them to ask the Egyptians for some gold and silver and whatnot, and boom, they gave them everything. Just get out of here. We're all going to die if you don't go. <laughs> so they plundered the Egyptians, as it says. Okay? And I want to read real quick in 13, verse 21. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they may travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. All the time they're out in the wilderness, they've got this. Now, the pillar of cloud would give them shade from the hot desert sun. The pillar of fire by night gives them heat in the cold desert nights, etc., plus light so they can travel by night. You know, when, so whenever God said move, they moved. When God said stop, they stopped. So if there was some kind of storm in the desert, God would just stop them, and the storm would go by, and then off they go afterwards, etc. right? So that was what, what goes on. But point is, God is with them, right? So they're traveling to the sea. The map doesn't give it to us, right? You know, and I'm convinced it was what we today call the Sea of Aquaba, right? the other side of the Arabian Peninsula, because we know specifically that they went to Midian. <laughs> and that's where Midian is, on the other side of the bigger sea. So, and there's this big old, for lack of a better word, sandbar. There's a big, big old area. It's still there today. where It's probably the place where they were camped. So they get over there next to the city and they're camped there. Right? Now it tells us in 13, right, that the, the Lord had sent them the long way around, so to speak, rather than the shortcut where in verse 17, you know, as it came about when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. <clears throat> For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and then return to Egypt. Right? So he's like, they're not ready to fight. And of course, that raises all kinds of questions in my mind because they weren't ready to fight the Egyptians either, but the Lord took care of that. <laughs> he could have taken care of the Philistines just as easy as he took care of the Egyptians. Right? Right? So whatever God's lessons were that he was wanting to teach everybody, right, he had his way of doing it. Do we always agree with what God's way of doing things? Sometimes they don't make sense to us, do they? Because we got a finite brain. <laughs> we have limited knowledge and understanding. And God has his ways. And it's funny uh, in the sense that all these things that God does, how they all tie together. You know, the, the whole concept of the Passover and how it all foreshadows what Jesus Christ is going to come and do and did, you know, for us. You know, <clears throat> the blood of the Lamb, well, the blood of the Lamb is Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood is what saves us from our sins, right? Not that little lamb, <laughs> And so, <clears throat> how God put all of this together, it's just like the Bible. How many books in the Bible? 66. Correct, 66. 
written by about 40 different men over about 1,500 years, and yet there's no contradictions, <laughs> right? It all ties together, and of course it's all about Jesus. Every book, it's all about Jesus, you know, because what God is going to do and has done for us and what he's going to come back and do, <laughs> right, that we read about in Revelations, etc. okay? So... <clears throat> So the, the Israelites now leave Egypt with all that silver and gold, etc., and they're traveling by day and night, and they get to the sea, and they're camped there. And the Lord, in verse four, chapter 14, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Phiha <laughs> you know, between... Migdal and the sea, you shall camp in front of Baal Siphon, opposite by the sea. So there they are, parked there. Who led them there? Who told them to camp there? Moses. Well, the Lord well, spoke the Lord to Moses. Said, yeah. yeah. God told them to go there. So, and Moses, of course, being God's prophet and spokesman, right? Which is what prophet actually means, right? So, God's telling them, go here and camp. So they go there and camp. And then what happens? Pharaoh's heart hardens, right? And he sends the army after him. Right? Yeah. In verse 10, as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. And the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Okay. They had seen over ten months, the ten plagues, including the death of the firstborn of everybody in Egypt, but not theirs. They had now left Egypt after <coughs> plundering them. And they're traveling, and who's with them? <coughs> The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Oh, yeah. The Lord. presence of God himself, right, is with them. And they see these minuscule army of ants traipsing across the desert. And they get afraid. Now, who created the heavens and the earth? God did. And what did he use to do it? His voice. His voice. Right? He spoke it into existence. <laughs> so the God who took them out of Egypt allowed them to plunder the Egyptians, protected them from the death of the firstborn, right? Right? who is with them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I mean, that alone ought to be a somewhat amazing sight. <laughs> right? Yeah. And they see the Egyptian army come traipsing across the desert. You know, they probably just saw a lot of dust. <laughs> and they become very frightened. Now, at least give them one credit. Right? They cried out to the Lord. Right? Later on in their history, they, they cried out, but not to the Lord. <laughs> in this case, at least, at least they turned to God. You know? Now, there is no justification, logically, for being frightened. But do we? When circumstances in our life aren't the way we like them, something's happening that we don't want to happen, do we become frightened? You know, and even irritable and... <laughs> That's what I've always said. People are stupid. <laughs> I mean, you see all this, you live it, you experience it, and all of a sudden, yeah, well, forget it. I'm scared. Yeah. So. That, we, we seem to forget what God has done in the past and what he's capable of doing. We forget about how much he loves us, and we get all kinds of spooky, 
because something's going on in our life that we don't like. It could be a health challenge, a financial challenge, a relationship challenge, right? And, and a lot of those are big deals. I don't want to downplay them. Like they're not a big deal. They're a big, they can be a very big deal. But we have a very big God. And so here they are frightened. They said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt <laughs> that you have taken us to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Now, we know from the end result that God got the Israelites out of Egypt, but he never got Egypt out of the Israelites. So they had to all die in the wilderness, all but two, right? Everybody, everybody over the age of 20 died and did not enter the promised land. He had to filter them out, <laughs> okay? Is it not the word that we have spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? <laughs> right? Where are you reading? In 12 yeah, or now. Yeah, yeah. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Really? After all they've seen, <laughs> this is the immediate reaction. But it's kind of human nature, isn't it? Yeah. You know? We always look at the problem and not the God. <laughs> That's a hard thing to shake, too. You know, I, I criticize them, ridicule them for being so stupid for, you know, how many years. But it's a very hard thing to break. It is human nature, yeah. right? You know, now we have, we have something they didn't have. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit himself. Not only is God with us, he's in us. And don't we react the same way many times? Something bad happens, we get scared, or we get, you just freak out and whatnot, rather than just turning to God and say, well, Lord, <laughs> I just had that car accident. I don't have any, you know, the insurance is not going to help me much and whatever the problem is, but okay. You have so many ways of solving my problems that I can't even imagine. Right? Just make one of them clear to me. You know? Yeah, not to mention it's your car anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so your car's kind of messed up. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> right? Whatever the issue is, if we focus on God and not the problem, not only is our attitude dramatically better, our witness is dramatically better, right? Our God is a lot happier with us. <laughs> you know, but He knows us, He knows in advance what we're going to do. He loved us and died for us anyway, in spite of how ridiculous we can be, right? As these were here. Moses, on the other hand, has made that transition. He says to the people, do not fear. Whenever an angel popped up, what was the first thing people did? Freaked out. <laughs> Mostly they were face down on the ground. And the angel would say, don't be afraid, Right? This Moses said, don't be afraid. You know, stand by, stand firm, right? Moses was calm, confident, and see the salvation of the Lord. God's going to take care of this. God didn't bring us out here to get killed by Egyptians or captured and taken back, you know. He's in control. Pharaoh is not in control, <laughs> God is. And, and Pharaoh's about to find that out. <laughs> right? And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. <laughs> you don't have to worry about those guys, and you will never see them again. <laughs> you don't have to worry about these Egyptians. They're about to be gone. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Now, Pharaoh has his trust in what? The army. His, his power, yeah. His army, his power, his false gods, etc., right? That's why the Egyptians, you know, that's the, they've been taught, you know. 
we've got these false gods over here, and you know, we've got the army, we're the, we're the world's power, right? And they, they have their faith in their power. How long did it take their power to get wiped out? <laughs> you know, in our country, do we have our faith in our military or in our God? Military. If God so chooses, in seconds, our military could be eliminated. Right? Mm -hmm. We need to have our faith, you know, and our trust in our God. And then if he chooses to use our military to execute his will, more power to him. <laughs> right? But to simply say that we are the most sophisticated, the most powerful army in the history of the world doesn't make us invulnerable. <laughs> We're still vulnerable. Especially when our country is running from God. And we've got a bad situation in this country where the enemy within is destroying this country. Yes, that's true. <clears throat> and making us vulnerable to the enemy without. And the people who are sworn to defend the Constitution from the enemy within and without are the enemy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, the Lord will fight for you today. In this case, they didn't even have to fight. Now, he didn't send them to the Philistines because they weren't ready to fight, right? And now in this case, he's saying, I got this, <laughs> right? How often do we tell the Lord, oh, Lord, it's okay, Lord, I got this. <laughs> right? I don't need your help. <laughs> yeah, I don't need your help today, you know. <laughs> Maybe after lunch. <laughs> if you don't wander off. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But stay handy just in case, right? You know, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? <laughs> tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Again, he gave Moses assurance. It's time to move. And as for you, lift up your staff and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it, and the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry ground. The depth of that sea is anywhere from, you know, the shallow part at the coast at the end, but down to 100 and whatever feet, you know, 200 feet, 500 feet, I don't remember now, you know, but it's what I forget how many miles 60 miles across something like that you know I mean it's this this they're about to walk through is no small deal <laughs> right he says you're going to go through on dry ground he said as for me behold I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so they will go in after them and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. See, the ten plagues didn't quite get it. <laughs> After they lost their firstborn, right, they still jumped on their chariots and their horses and, their, and, and marched, you know, to go after the Israelites. After what God had already done to them. But they figured it out pretty shortly, right? When I am honored through Pharaoh and through his chariots and his horsemen and the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel. Now, <laughs> you remember the phrase in, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord? Mm. Who is that? Who do we believe that to be? The pre-incarnate Jesus Christ himself, yeah. right? <laughs> Referred to as the angel of the Lord, Right? We know that God is present with Israel where? In the pillar of cloud <laughs> and the pillar of fire, right? And then it says, the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So the cloud, God, who had been going before them Apparently, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ himself moved to behind them. 
and protected them so the Egyptians could not advance. All right, now, you're the Egyptians. Right? And you're ready to attack, and suddenly you can't because <laughs> you can't see through the pillar of cloud. And then by night, it was fire. Right? So it came between the camp, in verse 20, of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus, the one did not come near the other all night. Now, you notice it says there was a cloud along with the darkness. So it appears to me it was a pillar of cloud and fire that night. Fire on the Israelite side gave them light. Cloud on the Egyptian side and put them in utter darkness. No advancing. Because <laughs> they couldn't see. But the Israelites could see. Right? And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land so the waters were divided. Right? So Moses in faith Stretched out his hand with the staff, the same staff that had turned to a snake, you know, right, etc. Right, and the waters parted. Now, some people try to explain this as this hurricane kind of thing, you know, and it's a natural phenomenon, da 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 da, you know. But when you read this, it's clear it's not. There's no way, you know, when you got a tsunami and you got the the water gets sucked out sometimes, you know, etc. You know. But there's no walls. <laughs> okay? And the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Okay? Now, when you've got a city and you build a wall, what's the purpose of the wall? Keeping you in or people out. It's a defensive measure. Yeah. Right? It's there to protect you. So we're, God is saying, I've got a wall of water to protect you on both sides, <laughs> right? You've got dry land. You've got two million people to cross. How, how wide do you think this path was? I think it's a lot wider than you saw in the Ten Commandments where it looked like about 20 or 30 feet, <laughs> right? This thing could have been a mile wide. It was still a good movie, though. Yeah, it was a good movie. Very good movie, right? The point was, is this thing is wide enough for two million people to cross in one day. <laughs> right? Were they running? Probably not. Why? <laughs> to get that many people across. Well, I, don't, I think you know, God had it under control. Duh. Right? When you see the waters part and dry ground for you to walk across, you know, and Moses leading you, and of course you've got animals, you got families, you got, you know, all kinds of people, kids, etc. I don't think they were running. Now, I don't think they were taking it easy either. You know, I think they wanted to get across. But they were just moving as briskly as they could, carrying all their stuff, including all the Egyptians' gold. <laughs> right? They had a lot of stuff to move across. You know, they had to pull up stakes. When they break camp, they had to take their tents down, fold everything up, you know, get it all packed up, and, and across they went, right? So you got a, 2 million people approximately. We know there were 600,000 men, <laughs> right, walking across. Then the Egyptians took, the, pr took up the pursuit, and all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen, went in after them into the midst of the sea. Why on earth would you do that? Well, they were on the dry ground following them. They didn't know that the sea was going to come back and get them. No, but they knew it had been parted. They could see the walls. Yeah. They knew that it was a very unusual occurrence. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, no question about that. Right? Yeah. And that God, the same God who had done all that other stuff to them, has now protected the Israelites and gave them a path to cross the sea because they thought they were trapped, right? They couldn't get away. And yet, they see this, and then Pharaoh's like, go after them. And they said, sure, why not? 
You know, man's pride can get him to go into some awful situations. <laughs> right? right. Yeah, and, and they go in there, right? Now, they did the same thing the Israelites did, right? <laughs> Went into a cross on dry land and probably got at least halfway across. I don't know how big the army was, you know, but it was big enough to they thought they could crowd 600,000 men, <laughs> right? You know, I don't know how many, might have been 50,000 soldiers. Don't know. But here they are, bustling into the cross on dry land, right? You know, the wall is there, the water wall to defend the Israelites, but it's not there to defend the Egyptians. So sometimes an act that we think is an act of faith can be our pride going before us. Proverbs tells us that pride goes before the fall, right? So we've got to make sure we're on the same page with God so when we take steps, we're taking the steps that he's asking us to take, you know, and not, you know, say, Lord, I got this, <laughs> you know, I'll take care of this, right? And so they go in there, and they, same act that the, the Israelites did, and it came about at the morning watch that the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of cloud, a fire and cloud, and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. So now they're just kind of circling around down in there. <laughs> and it sounds like he caused their chariot wheels to swerve or to fall off, right? And he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from Israel for the Lord, the Lord is fighting for them and against the Egyptians. No kidding, right? Well, at least they figured it out. I wonder how many of them at that moment, confess that God, you know, is the Lord. Yeah. Some of them may have actually gotten saved right there at that moment, <laughs> right before they had a big gulp. <laughs> I don't know. But at least at this moment, they're saying that, right? The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots, and over their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. <laughs> then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. You know, the Lord did a great thing for the Israelites and freed them after 430 years in Egypt, right? And they get mad at him for doing it. <laughs> and then he does this and parts the water and they cross over on dry ground. Now, he could have made them boats, right? He could have had an army of dolphins show up <laughs> and sail them across. He decided to part the sea and turn the, the, the bottom of it, you know, which had been wet for, you know, what, a couple of thousand years, <laughs> right? That water was soaked in down there pretty deep, right? And he dried it out for them to walk across on dry ground, okay? The waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them, not even one of them remained. That's a lot of folks. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of dead people right there. You know. And horses. And, yeah, all the horses that were pulling the chariots and the ones that were riding and all the guys on foot, you know. But the sons of Israel walked on dry ground. through the midst of the sea, and their waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left, right? Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Some of them washed up, right? 
And when Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. <laughs> At least for a few days. <laughs> right? Israel didn't have to fight. God took care of it. Their salvation from their bondage and slavery was totally dependent upon God. Our salvation from our bondage to sin and death is totally dependent upon God. Amen. Amen. That's true. Same lesson. So <laughs> we walk away from this thinking, how often do I mistrust God <laughs> when I should be trusting Him? Well, the biggest problem is trying to figure out exactly what it is that God's saying to you so that you don't misunderstand what he's doing. But you know what, Jerry? When you're worried about it and you're trying to do what God is saying to you, he'll take care of you. That's Because remember, it's what's in your heart that counts. Jesus told us, right? So what's in your heart? Yeah, because so, I always wonder how, you, how, how, when it comes right down to that fine line, how do you discern between what God's telling you in pride? Because it, it really gets to a fine point, you can teeter either way, and it's like, man, man. <laughs> yeah, it is, and I, I struggle with that too. I mean, yeah. we all do, you know. But again, if we're just trying to listen and trying to do the best we can, and God will take care of us. Right? Yeah, I agree. Okay, any other questions or comments about our chapter 14 of Exodus, <laughs> the parting of the Red Sea? <laughs>